So uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, webinar update uh, with SK Mining. Uh, my name is Jacob Willoughby. I'm a Vice President of Research here at Red Cloud Securities. Joining me uh, remotely, as you can see, is uh, uh, Dr. Quentin Henning from SK, uh, an advisor to the company who I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, we're going to begin today's webinar with a presentation from Dr. Henning that will provide an overview of uh, SK Mining and also update us on the company's exploration projects and plans. And after that, we'll be able to take questions from participants. But before we begin, we have to go over everyone's favorite section again, uh, which are the disclosures. Uh, so for SK, there may be some forward-looking statements made during this presentation. And I would direct listeners to the cautionary note on page two of the company's corporate presentation on their website. For Red Cloud Securities, uh, please see the full disclaimer and disclosures on our website. And I highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. Also, we note that this call does not take into count the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Red Cloud specific disclosures related to uh, SK. Uh, in the past 12 months, Red Cloud Securities has been retained under a service or advisory agreement by the subject issuer being SK Mart. Okay. With that said, we can now begin. I'll ask Dr. Henning to uh, tell us more about SK Mining and uh, their exploration plants. All right, thank you very much. I'm gonna slide, start a slide presentation here. Um, best way to go through things. It's, uh, it's you know, mostly technical focused, so you know, hopefully people can bear with me while I talk a bunch of geology. But it's really the, the core reason that uh, I've decided to help SK. I've known about the project and this area for quite some time. I've always been uh, intrigued with, uh, you know, the SK deposit. The SK discovery back in the 1980s was one of the, you know, one of the best exploration success stories I think we've had in the mining industry. Very high grade deposit. Um, the geology is just absolutely bewildering in some respects. Uh, people think it's one of a kind, but uh, usually when you get into these types of systems, these are volcanogenic mass of sulfide systems, they don't occur as one-offs, they occur as clusters. And I think that SK Mining Corp, the, the property which is immediately adjacent and south of SK Mine, as, as we'll see here shortly, is certainly ripe for discovery of additional VMS systems. All right, so today I'm gonna walk people through a series of slides, again, mostly technical. Um, I uh, joined here just recently. Um, I felt compelled mainly because uh, I know a lot about VMS. Actually, mo mo both my master's and PhD were on VMS systems, uh, Kit Greek for my master's, and Nevis Corvo for my doctorate. Uh, but also, I have uh, a friend here in, in the local area where I live in Colorado, near uh, Colorado School of Mines. He's a professor, uh, his name is Thomas Monarchy, and Thomas is by and far the, the world's leading expert in VMS systems. Uh, I've asked Mac uh, to you know, bring in this team, Thomas's team from Colorado School of Mines to help us. I think it builds a very compelling and strong exploration team to tackle what is uh, you know, certainly a very ripe uh, target area for, for VMS systems. Uh, we heard a little about the forward-looking statements a moment ago. These are available on SK's mining uh, web website. I'd ask you to read those at your leisure at that time. Okay, uh, what we're going to do is start with a little local geology, or geography, rather. Uh, we're going to look at where SK's property sits in respect to many other world-class deposits, and this is northern British Columbia, as you can see in the, the inset in the lower left. We are right next to some of the most prolific systems, okay? KSM, the Kersolf-Retz uh, area is immediately east of 
Eskies uh, property, which is highlighted in that box. Bruce Tech, which is an operating mine, Predium's mine, also uh, immediately east. Uh, the old SK Creek deposit, which I talked about briefly, is immediately above uh, SK Mining's property. So it's immediately north. But there's other well known deposits in the region. You got SNP to the northwest, there's Good Lower Creek. Uh, also to the north, uh, you've got the old Premier Mine. Um, which is Ascot uh, down here. You've got Big Missouri, and then Dolly Varden, which a lot of people have heard of, uh, high-grade silver. All of these deposits uh, are, are quite interesting because there's a there's a kind of a, a smorgasbord of different geology involved here. But I would argue strongly that there is an underlying theme that a lot of these systems, at least the initial mineralizing event in this region, is actually a sin deposition or sin sedimentary event that that dates way back to when the first rocks were laid down. Okay, so uh, a lot of what you see here, either in part or in whole, is related to mineralizing events that are similar in age to the Eskerke Creek deposit. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. All right, the first few slides I have uh, Thomas Monarchy to think. He's provided me a few geology slides to talk to. This shows uh, geology of the, the immediate area. Uh, Eskate Creek Mine is up here in the north central part of the, the image. The green rocks that you see, uh, those are the Hazelton group, and that is actually the host, you know, it hosts the whole sequence for the Eskate Creek deposit. Uh, we also have some intrusive rocks shown in, in red, and then um, older uh, basement type rocks uh, shown in blue. And then the, the yellow is a, a somewhat younger sequence, slightly younger sequence than the green. It's basically a sedimentary sequence that engulfed the green rocks uh, shortly after their deposition. So you can think of this as, as pretty much a layer cake. It is folded and faulted a bit, but overall, the strata, you know, the strata or the you know, the predictability of these layers is, is quite good. Uh, and notice that we're not dealing with just huge amounts of overturning and overthrusting and stuff. There is certainly thrusting involved, but uh, by and large, the, the geology is reasonably predictable uh, in, this, in this region, which is important. You know, to target an area, the more complicated it gets, the more challenging it can be to explore. I don't think we're dealing with that kind of environment. Okay, a little bit about the SK Creek mine. Uh, it shows you the adit there in the upper right. Uh, this was a small mine, but it was exceptionally high grade. You can see that the, the uh, grade of production over mine, life of mine was around 49 grams gold. Also had a huge amount of silver, 2.3 kilograms of silver per ton. Absolutely unbelievable grades. Um, as we've seen today, Skeena announced... Uh, uh, PEA level study, I believe it was, of the the remaining resources at Eskim. Um, quite a robust PEA. If people haven't seen that, I would recommend you check it out. It is a testimony to what grade can do for for uh, an ore deposit. So um, I think we're, you know, that's one of the things that intrigues me is finding that such high grade mineralization. This slide shows. Uh, some very telling things about SK Creek with respect to other VMS systems around the world. All right, so what we have here, all these little dots are various uh, VMS systems. On the vertical axis, we have gold grade in grams per ton. And then on the bottom axis, we have the deposit tonnage, basically the size in terms of the ore uh, tonnage. All right, you can see SK Creek sits way up here at the top. What does this mean? Well, it means it's very high grade, all right? So we're basically up here in the, again, around 49 gram per ton, puts it way and above everything else on the chart. As far as tonnage goes, though, it's roughly in the, the middle of this uh, large spectrum of VMS deposits. So it's really not that big of a deposit in terms of, in terms of tons, but it's gold endowment was absolutely huge. You can see the gold endowment, overall gold was uh, I think around 110 tons. This line, diagonal line right here, defines 100 tons of gold contained. Okay, so it puts SK in the same class as Bulletin, uh, as well as the old horn mine, 
and some other well-known mines like Mount Morgan deposit in Australia and, and Laurent, which is Agnico's deposit in Quebec. You know, so we're, we're in a special regime here. We're really in the top tier of VMS deposits in terms of gold endowment. Certainly top tier, uh, top of the, of all of them in terms of gold grade. But in terms of tonnage, it's not that high. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, usually in VMS camps, you get, uh, you know, some smaller tonnage deposits. You get some middle ton deposits and then you get one or two bigger ton, tonnage deposits. You know, that's just the nature of VMS camps. Um, in the case of SK Creek, you know, it is entirely possible that this is just one of, of multiple VMS systems in this area and that it just happens to be kind of in the middle range in terms of its tonnage. Okay, that's an intriguing thought, you know, and that's, again, what intrigues me about exploring here. All right, this is a, a close-up geologic map of the SK Creek area. We're basically at the nose of an anticline. This is a, an upfolded sequence of rocks here. The core, which are these blue rocks here, these are the older ones. That's a basement sequence, at least local basement in this area. Uh, you can see above it, we have a sequence of rhyolites in pink, and then we have uh, basalt in blue. Now, the pink blobs you see here, that's the footprint of the SK deposit. Most of this is actually subsurface. This is just the footprint as projected to, to surface. All right, so uh, you can think of this, that that pink jelly, if you will, is kind of sandwiched between this pink volcanic rock, the rhyolite, and the, the purple, or, or sorry, uh, blue rock, which is the basalt, blue-green rock, which is the basalt. All right, so this jelly is kind of sandwiched between these two. That's important, okay? If you're going to go looking for more SK deposits, it appears that that stratigraphic break between these two is very, very critical, okay? And I'll show you why that's important here in a bit. Um, think about it this way, okay? A VMS deposit, these are deposits that are spewed out on the sea floor. They have to form in a period of quiescence. If they formed in a period where there was a lot of, uh, you know, volcanism or sedimentation or something going on, they would either be jumbled up or diluted or, you know, you name it, they would be messed up somehow. They'd be just basically obliterated. You need a period of quiescence. In other words, quiet period between, say, the deposition of rhyolite and then the deposition of basalt where there's enough time for the sulfides to accumulate. That's interesting because that, that break, which is actually defined by a little bit of mudstone in between these uh, units, is absolutely critical, and that's going to be the key to our exploration in the coming years. Okay, this shows a section through the, the system. Again, you know, this is layer cake geology. Here's the, the older rocks. This is actually a day site sequence. The basement rocks are down here. But then there's our, there's our rhyolite sequence. This is that uh, pink unit. Notice that up here, there's a very, very thin horizon, uh, even down here in, in places. That's the stratiform type mineralization. That's basically layered mineralization, sulfide in nature. And then there is at least some discordant, uh, maybe potentially upwelling or stockwork type mineralization down into the rhyolite as well. The whole sequence is capped by this basalt, which is the blue-green, but notice this little tiny kind of uh, olive-colored unit here. That is that carbonaceous mudstone, okay? And that's, again, very critical here. That's that period of quiescence when, when these deposits form. Finding that unit, finding that mudstone is really uh, the, the target of exploration. You know, once we find the mudstone, then you can start looking for the VMS system within it. Okay, these are stratigraphic columns. They show a little bit of detail. Uh, the pink is the, the rhyolite. The, you know, blue-green up here, those are the basalts. And notice the story gets a little more complex when you look at it in detail. Uh, overall, these sections are about 100, 120 meters thick, and these are basically core logs that uh, were done by Thomas Monarchy. And they show the position of the sulfide mineralization in pink in here. Notice how it's in the mudstone, okay, it's, it's in, in this uh, position. But uh, it's kind of split in, in some places, or, you know, like here, it's split again, or it's floating up above uh, these horizons, whatever. But what's happened here is you, you basically have deposited this rhyolite, and then you were depositing mud, the, the olive unit, on top of that rhyolite during a period of quiescence. 
and the sulfites, this gold-rich uh, material was being laid down or even injected uh, in the mud sequence. Then, at some point, this basalt, this uh, greenish unit, came out, but it didn't come out necessarily as flows. What it did is it came in as silt, so it basically split the thing open kind of like, uh, think of it like uh, baklava or something like this. You know, it, did, it worked its way through the mud, and it actually split the ore uh, apart. Like this is probably was once connected to this, but it's been split by this silt of uh, of basalt. That's really intriguing. Okay, uh, that's that's just a uh, you know it's com a complexity, but it's got to be appreciated when you're out exploring for this type of system. You can actually uh, start to see uh, some very interesting patterns. In, if you find one little whiff, like if you find this, there's certainly a possibility to find something like this or this nearby. Okay, here's the footprint of the deposits. This shows you a close-up of the various deposits that were either mined or still present in SK. Uh, some of them are stratiform, such as the, the 21B, C, and A, and the east block zones. But then you also have the discordant type. These are you know, the po possible stockwork type zones. They're mainly up here. Most of the stuff down here is stratiform in nature. These are pictures of ore types. Uh, you have anything from coarse uh, sedimentary sulfide units. You can see little fragments of sulfide all through here. Most of this yellowish stuff is pyrite. Uh, the dark gray is a dark carbonaceous mudstone. There's little class of mudstone that have been ripped up and incorporated with the sulfide. This was uh, is what we call a turbidite. It's basically a, a sulfide flow that, that slid down the hill, kind of mixed up and ripped up things as it was going along uh, in a submarine environment. Okay, so this this is really interesting ore. It's probably not far from a vent, you know, some sort of feeder, but it's certainly not sitting on top of the feeder. It's been uh, transported down a slope. As you go further down the slope, the, the sulfide becomes finer grain and it becomes more laminated like this. So here we have a uh, little laminate of sulfides interbedded with black mud. Okay, these are, these are extremely gold rich, uh, you know, but the, the material in between the mud is, is nearly barren. Okay, so the, the gold's in the sulfides, the mud is nearly barren. You can see one event after another. This thing, you know, as, as it was spewing out on the sea floor, basically uh, caused these little cascades of sulfides to flow down the hill and away from the vent. When you get very far out, it turns almost to pinstripe, okay? These are very, very thin layers of sulfides intercalated with, with mudstone. Nonetheless, there's enough sulfide in here to still generate very good grades of gold, All right? So this says proximal to the vent. This says a bit dis more distant, and this says um, even more distant still. So when you drill in this area and you start to see one of these types of mineralization, you can start to gauge where you are in the system. This is interesting. Okay, so now, now we have a, an image of the SK deposit looking straight down. North is actually a bit this way. All right, but this shows you the, the distribution of the various ore types with respect to space. This is a scale of 100 meters. Right over the guts of this thing, you know, basically where there was upwelling and, and deposition of, of uh, sulfide, you know, through vents and so forth, you get coarse plastic sulfide like this. All right, so this is proximal. As you go a little bit further out, you see material more like this. So in B, we, we're starting to see somewhat finer grain, but still coarse plastic sulfide. As you go still further out, you get down into the, the more laminated sulfides in mudstone. And then further out still, you get into the disseminated. All right, so this, this gives you a sense of scale, roughly four or 500 meters away from what is probably the vent area you go from uh, coarse plastic sulfide all the way down to disseminated sulfides. Again, if you're out exploring for, for this type of system, you have to look at what the rock's telling you. Okay, if you drill a hole and you see this, you say, well, gee, we must be, you know, say 500 meters away from an ore body. Okay, that's, that's interesting. That's a very good guide to help you explore. Here's a little bit more in profile. Now, this the focus of this slide, uh, this is a, a cross-section similar to the one we saw through the ore body. What it shows you is the rhyolite. This is the footwall rhyolite. And then there's these areas of uh, alteration. It's a carbonate alteration. And it's called discordant mineralization. It's basically stock work or you know, feeder-type mineralization. It's places where there was upwelling of fluids during on the seafloor. So fluids were coming up like this. They were altering the rhyolite. 
and then ultimately they they you know reach the the top here and, and spewed out as uh, some sort of sulfide body. All right, these bodies of carbonate are very interesting. All right, now I'm going to show a slide here in a bit that just really struck me when I started looking at SK mining. Okay, so what do we have here? Well, here's the SK property. Uh, we've got Bruce Jack next door. We've got Kersal Peretz in this area. Mitchell is over here. All right, we have uh, two packages of land belonging to SK. The one here is uh, 80 percent SK mining, 20 percent Kirkland Lake ownership. Uh, the one down here, which is called Corey, is 100 percent SK ownership. And basically there's a belt extending from the old SK Creek mine southward through this region that I think is highly prospective for uh, BMS type mineralization. There's been uh, historic prospecting and, and drilling at the Siblulu area, also at the Jeff TV, and then down here, uh, to, a, to a lesser extent, down here in what's called the core group of targets. Okay, these are 100% owned ASCII, whereas these up here, uh, this, this is actually split ownership. There's a bit 100%, a bit of 80%, and then Sibalulu is mainly 80% ownership. All right, what, what's so special about this belt? Well, this is basically the center of the, the rift system that the ASCII Creek deposit formed in. Okay, so back in the days when the, the rocks were being deposited on the sea floor, we had a kind of a rift that trended north-south through here. And I think that this is why this belt in particular is so perspective for, for these types of deposits. This shows you a geologic map, same uh, footprint to the land package here. This is the 100% on ground down here. You have the 80-20 ground up here. Eskrit Creek Mine up in the top. Uh, you got Sibalulu in this area. Down here, uh, actually TB and Jeff are not shown, but they're roughly in here. Uh, and then this is the quarry group of prospects down in here. Again, you can see there's a overall, geologically, there's a trend in the geology north-south uh, along that axis of the, the former rift grabbing. What's interesting here, notice how much of the darker green is in this region. Okay, that darker green is the overlying basalt sequence. Now think about that for a minute. That means that underneath that you should have the mudstone and the perspective rhyolite sequence. That means this entire area here, in my view, is highly perspective for finding VMS, buried VMS deposits. There's little windows like this where you can see a bit of uh, the, the lower sequence actually poking its head up. That's intriguing. It says that pretty much this entire region here is underlain at what is probably reasonably shallow depth. In other words, explorable depth and you know has that potential to to host vms deposits okay go back to my slide a few minutes ago where i talked about sk in terms of tonnage who's to say there's not a bigger deposit buried somewhere down in here there might be multiple vms uh, systems and that's usually the case in these camps that are hidden down here in this neck of the woods i am just absolutely stoked about uh, exploring this area Okay, just to give you a taste of what has been done and what potential there is, I've got a few slides. Now, the first thing I'm going to tell everybody is I joined about, you know, a few weeks ago, and then I asked Mac to bring uh, Thomas Monarchy and his team from Colorado School of Mines in. I like working with very good, smart people. Thomas is one of the smartest guys I've, I've ever met. Uh, he's absolutely brilliant in the field of VMS deposits. And his team is, you know, his students and so forth, uh, including John DeDecker, who's a postdoc, who's going to work on this project directly, are very, very smart individuals. Okay, so we've got the A team here. Um, I do not go into ex exploration, you know, for a company just for giggles, okay? When I go in it based on good geology, and here I see absolutely fantastic geology, but I also have to have a good team. Uh, I'll give you an example, uh, Lion One. I joined Lion One a few months ago. It took us a little while to get some, you know, get things organized, but we started exploration about, uh, I don't know, about two months ago. I think we announced at the Denver Gold Forum that we were going to start doing some deeper drilling, uh, doing some legwork and things like that. And by gummy, it's paid off. Okay. If you look at the news we released today, absolutely amazing, uh, productivity over the past couple of months. And, and that's what I like to do. I like to, the first take a bit of time, uh, put 
all the brain power I can, you know, including these uh, other folks who are helping together to, to really develop this thing and, and you know, think of the mo most effective means of exploring the system and then tackle it from there. Okay, so we're in early stages, but I'm now going to give you a picture of what, you know, some of what we know here. Okay, this is a, a bit of drilling. It's mostly shallow drilling at the Jeff target. So this is kind of the central uh, part of the, the whole property. Uh, most of these holes are, are short. They're, you know, 100, 120 meters, maybe 150 meters long. But, and they're historic. These, these go way back. You can see the dates on these things. These are ancient history, quite frankly. But look at here, guys. Uh, you have four meters of 47 grams per ton of gold. That is in line with the grade seen at SK Creek. Okay, you, you might say, well, gee, there's a bunch of other holes that look like it cuts it off and so forth. Not really. Okay, this hole is open down in that direction. I believe that's northeast or thereabouts. Okay, this this type of intercept, going back and looking at that geology and thinking about it in context of what I showed you earlier, where it sits in the mudstone, where it sits in the basalt. Notice there's basalt right next to it. You know, this is what we need to sort out, okay? Think about the basalt splitting these things apart. Why Why do you see multiple uh, drill intercepts in, in a given hole? Well, it's because this is that same regime that you see at SK Creek. And by gummy, it's already generated grades that you see at SK Creek. So, so don't tell me there's not something here. There is something kicking around, okay? Here's another intercept. A little skinnier, but 15 grams per ton gold. That does not fall out of the sky. There is something going on here. We're going to sort it out. All right, here's another area. This is the core area. I'd say this is least explored of all of them. It's more distal or remote on the property. It's a little bit harder to get to. But, man, is this perspective area. Okay, this is extremely exciting stuff. Uh, there has been some ex historic drilling. These, these uh, kind of cryptic little disks and whatnot you see through here are actually drill intercepts uh, from historic time. There's also surface samples. Uh, so they're kind of below this this surface. The gray is the shaded topography, all right? But these red blobs uh, were found through an IP survey that was done a few years ago. They've never really been followed up and drilled. The red blobs post-date most of the drilling you see in this image. These are chargeable features. They're they're basically telling us there's rock down there that, that has chargeable properties. It, it you know it, it's able to accumulate electrical charge. What accumulates electrical charge? Well, things like mudstone and sulfides and wonderful things like that. Okay, so so here we have already at least some data that tells us there's potential for, for sulfides and mudstone. And this is down in that area where you have a basalt cap on top of a rhyolite. And like I said, there's high prospectivity at a reasonably shallow depth underneath this basalt for SK-type mineralization. Now, these are, are three of the targets. You know, I, I'm even starting to learn the names for myself, like the C10 and, and GFJ and so forth. But the one that really intrigues me sits out here. It's actually on top of this mountain, this mountain madge. It's called the Tet, and I'm going to show you why here in just a jiffy. Okay, this rock came from Tet. This is quartz siderite, all right? Uh, this gray stuff in here is called tetrahedrite. It's an extremely high-grade silver uh, mineral. Tetrahedrite uh, is, you know, it's got many percent level uh, silver in its mineral structure. And this rock sample is grading uh, several percentage silver. Okay, now think about this for a minute. When I showed this rock to Thomas Monikin, I said, what do you think of this? He said, my gosh, that looks a lot like the carbonate that you see the discordant mineralization that you see over at the SK mine. Well, this is like, this is like, I don't know, 15, 10, 15 kilometers south of SK in a totally new area. Okay, in my view, this rock is some of that carbonate uh, footwall alteration that, that you see like at the SK Creek mine. All right, and it's got stockwork uh, sulfides coming up through it, much like, you know, stockwork for a VMS. Right. So my thesis here, or my hypothesis, working hypothesis, is Tet is showing us a little window down into that, that critical rhyolite sequence where we see some carbonate alteration and we're seeing this lovely uh, stockwork mineralization. Well, what does that tell us? It means there's something down here, okay? And you do not see rocks like this every day. Why this hasn't been followed up more aggressively, I have no earthly idea. 
But I'll tell you what, if I get on a helicopter when I get to camp, I'm going to go to this spot the first thing. Okay, next slide. Look, I only put one slide in for Sib Lulu. This is the northernmost area. It's actually, you know, just a, a couple kilometers south of the Ascade Creek Mine. But it's still highly prospective. Here we see some drill holes. And up in this part of the section, you see mudstone and basalt. Mm, what does that tell you? You're in the right part of the section. This is a drill hole that was done by Silver Standard. Okay, Silver Standard had an option on uh, on the you know some of the ground here that SK owns. Uh, they came in, explored. I think they had two seasons. Uh, very smart geologists. Uh, look, you know, and I, I do not mean any disrespect whatsoever because the geology they did was fantastic. But unfortunately, Silver Standard did not support the exploration program. Uh, you know, beyond the the second year, and it's you know. It, Sorry, but their loss, okay, uh, they made a discovery, and we're going to follow up on it. Okay, this hole right here, 160, hit uh, a meter of 62 gram per ton gold. That is in mudstone. I've looked at the photographs. I've looked at the textures of that sample, and it looks a heck of a lot like some of the disseminated or, or some of the styles of mineralization I showed a few slides back. What does that mean? Well, it means that we're somewhere in the neck of the woods of SK type mineralization. Okay, that in, in itself, whether that's economic, don't know. It's pretty skinny. But by golly, I think we're very close to SK type uh, geology somewhere nearby. You know, and when I say nearby, I'm talking within a few hundred meters. All right, so that's the stuff that gets me excited. I hope that I've given you uh, a good you know, feel for where, where we're at, what we're, what we plan to do. Uh, one of the keys as I see it is finding that mudstone, finding that perspective horizon. I'm working with uh, Tom Weiss, who's the geophysicist working with us. Tom was chief geophysicist at Newmont while I was there. He and I have worked together on many, many projects for many years. He's helping me at, uh, he's helped me in Australia. He's helped me in uh, Fiji. He's helped me back at evolving days, et cetera, et cetera. He's a very smart guy and he and I, We'll put together some geophysical work that should help highlight this mud sequence here and help really focus our exploration and then bring home some targets very, very quickly. So with that, I'll stop yapping and let people uh, ask questions. Thank you, Dr. Henning. Uh, that was great, uh, although uh, geologically heavy, as you uh, warned us. As always. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I very much enjoyed it because I'm an unabashed uh, VMS fan. Um, and I guess probably the biggest question people have about SK Creek is, uh, why hasn't SK number two been found? And, and if I was able to glean anything from, from your talk, it's that it could be because the, those basalts have just blanketed where the deposits could be. Is that fair? I would say that's that's 90 percent of the reason that it's it, yes the it results cap it but they're wonderful things look i worked at never scorbo uh never scorbo was a blind discovery okay uh it was found some 280 meters below the surface in an area mm -hmm. where nobody thought to pros prospect this is an iberian pirate it yeah. was a wonderful discovery very big deposit and that's the kind of potential i see under those results i would say that's the lead reason uh you haven't found sk2 but the other part of it is this and look, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not trying to jab anyone here. And Mac would agree with me. I've talked to Mac many times. If look, this property has been a promotional play for many, many years. Nobody's really come in and looked at it holistically and done good science and targeted these things, okay? And Thomas Monike, uh and I uh, both have a lot of EMS experience, him by far more than I do. But, uh, look, we will do things right. Okay. Uh, great. So... One of the opportunities uh, with SK is that there's a lot of ground, right? Uh, it's a pretty big property. And uh, so maybe, I mean, are you able to say which parts of the property you want to focus more on yet? You know, it is daunting, I got to say. Uh, you're looking at a, a huge land package. I think it's 500 square kilometers. I would say probably uh, half or maybe 35, 40% of that is within that kind of you know, perspective corridor. Okay, so that narrows it down a bit. Uh, fortunately, there's been enough exploration in historic terms in Sib Lulu, uh, Jeff, you know, Jeff, and, and Anna Corey that we know a little bit about what's going on. So we can focus things. 
All right, the key here is to develop targets very quickly. So our game is going to be to do geophysics early on next year, uh, probably IP as well as uh, EM to try to define that, that mudstone horizon and then simply chase it from there. Uh, how long will this take? Yeah, we're going to drill some stuff next year. I, I fully intend if I can get the, you know, get the company revved up here uh, to raise money, drill some targets next year. But really, this is a multi-year effort. Uh, but with that said, the prize is easily justified here. These are, you know, this is the big one. Uh, that test mineralization, and that is aqua fever, and that's the silver grade, you know, which a percent level is telling us anything. There is something very intriguing, very nearby that showing. Right. And uh, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you touched on the, the mudstone, uh, because I think after listening to your, your talk, one of the things that sticks out is, Okay, well, how are you going to find the mudstone? And I think maybe the answer is the uh, chargeability signature. Yeah, a bit of charge. Okay, so the mudstone will have a chargeable, uh, you know, attribute. Absolutely. But here's the other thing that works in their favor. Uh, you've got a lot of contrast between that rhyolite below it, which is resistive, and the mudstone, which is going to be conductive. Okay, so there's a difference. Chargeability is not the same as conductivity. Okay, mm -hmm. chargeability means it can build up electricity. Conductivity means it can conduct electricity. The other way to explore for this is to use EM, which looks at the, the conductivity properties of rock. And in this case, you're seeing, you can see that contrast between the, the conductive mudstones and the resistive uh, footwall rhyolite. Okay. And that's the other critical component here. Mm -hmm. So uh, that follows on to another question I had uh, on targeting. Um, you know, you're, you're obviously very excited on, um, on TET uh, for reasons we went into. And you, as you said, you want to get up to uh, Sibluulu uh, as soon as you can. But would you say you, you have some ready-made targets or do you still want to do some more work before you're, you're willing to, to focus on them? I would, I would say right now we have probably five or six targets that are, are close to being drill ready. That, you know, in other words, there's a chargeable feature that's been identified by some past IP survey uh, and it looks as though you're in a mudstone sequence in that location. So I would say there's, there's some targets that are near ready, just, just mainly by happenstance, you know, if anything. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but I, look, I want to expand those surveys around, say, that TET area. I want to build that uh, database and, and really hone in on what kind of sulfide body might be nearby. Right. Okay. Uh, and, and you yourself, um, I mean, there's got to be tons of data uh, over the years on this. And you're doing, I guess, a lot of compilation work. What, what specifically are you focusing on in, in your efforts with SK? Okay, look, there is a huge amount of data, and I'm not pretending that I'm going through it all. Okay, that's why we've hired Thomas and, and a bunch of smart uh, students over at School of Mines. Sure. Um, one of the specialties of Thomas and, and John De Decker is uh, lithogeochemistry. It sounds like a mouthful, but what it means is they can look at the chemistry of rock data, you know, like drill hole data. Okay, they can look at what the chemistry tells you about what kind of rocks you're in. Okay, and we know what SK Creek rocks look like. If they take that information and they compare it to historic drill holes or other work that's been done on the property, it should help refine our understanding of where that critical level is in uh, in a lot of these targets. And that helps lead us to, you know, drilling next year in, in a, a much more, um, you know, predictable and hopefully uh, productive way. I mean, a lot of times in VMS belts, uh, people rely on uh, aerial and ground geophysics, but... I, I guess if the, that basalt has, has uh, uh, kind of blanketed everything, then those would get muddied by that, and, and, and that might not be able to, to help you locate stuff. I, I think we can still see things, okay? Uh, I, I truly do. Look, I've done a lot of CSAMT work lately. This is all ground-based stuff. Yeah. It, it, like the stuff I did in Japan uh, over the past few months, my gosh, it, it is absolutely wonderful data. You know, CSAMT, the resolution these days is incredible. You can see layering just as plain as Jane. So uh, look, it, no, it's easily uh, easily targetable down to depths of 800 to 1,000 meters. No problem. Okay, great. Uh, I think uh, that uh, wraps up the time we have for today, but I just want to uh, extend a huge thank you to, to you, Dr. Henning, for doing this. 
Uh, I certainly learned a lot, as I always do whenever I get a chance to uh, sit down with you. And uh, hopefully, you know, be able to follow up on this when there's some, some more news and, and data to digest. Super. Anytime. Cheers. Take care.